Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode is called Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind. And by that, I mean, of course, onboard UFO encounters. These are my favorite of all UFO encounters. They're so fascinating. They're the most extensive of all UFO encounters. Really, they contain, they encompass all the different types of UFO encounters that we have. Simple sightings, landings, face-to-face -face meetings with extraterrestrials, and when someone is taken on board, there's virtually no chance of misperception. You're enveloped by the UFO phenomena. You're right in the heart of it, feeling it, seeing it, tasting it, hearing it, the whole deal. So yeah, these cases really have a lot to contribute to our understanding of what it's like to have ET contact and answer many of the questions surrounding it. Like, who are they and why are they here? So these five cases I've chosen for you today are pretty obscure cases. I'd be very surprised if you've heard of them before, but they're also super interesting. Uh, these cases come from all over the world. I have a case from Austria, one from France, one from Brazil, and two from the United States, one from Washington and the other from Georgia. These involve a wide variety of ETs and also contain some very compelling physical evidence. So some very interesting cases, to say the least. And the first case I want to talk about today took place quite some time ago. I call this one, I Thought I Was Dead. And this is a first-hand case which took place way back in May 15, 1951 in Salzburg, Austria. This case was not officially investigated, and it was kept secret by the witness for many years. He finally decided to come forward because it had been weighing on his mind, and he was afraid that he would pass away without anyone knowing what had happened to him. It's a really compelling encounter that was recalled fully consciously without the aid of hypnosis, and it's got some really interesting elements, which at the time were certainly not well known, but over the years have been verified over and over again. This case has never been officially investigated, and it's not super well known, but it's certainly interesting and a very early account. It first appeared in the Prince George Citizen newspaper, and it involves an anonymous gentleman, an army officer, who was interviewed by editor and reporter Ron Powell. So I'll just call him John. And John told the editor of the Prince George Citizen newspaper, quote, I have a story I would very much like to tell you, but I'm afraid you might think me completely crazy or else laugh at me. And it was an amazing story he had to share. It was late on the evening of May 15, and John was about five miles north of Salzburg, again in Austria, and he was taking a two-mile-long walk back to his place of residence. Suddenly, he was approached by a man wearing a helmet, and John found himself inexplicably paralyzed, and he could only watch as the man strapped this weird, black, square-shaped device to his chest and then started to walk away, and John found himself seemingly floating after the man. He was led to a round object about 150 feet in diameter, which was landed in a field, and he was taken inside. John found himself in this strange room with a transparent ceiling. At this point, the paralysis released when this man stopped pointing a weird little handheld device at John. John sank to the floor, and he first thought he had been captured by spies. But then the ship began to rise upwards, and looking through the transparent section, he could see first only stars and then the moon, but soon began to see daylight. And he now looked over and he could see this person who had captured him standing on the other side of the room, operating strange levers. And as John says in his own words, he looked like a person like we are, a little bit shorter than me. He had no hair at all. I could see through the sort of glass helmet. His head was sort of a cylinder form. A very high forehead with big eyes. 
You could see lots of little eyes in the two big eyes. It seemed to me it looked like the eyes of a fly. No nose at all, just two holes. He had a very small slit for a mouth. It looked like he had skin. It was sort of white. There were two holes for ears. His skull was very large. He had no eyebrows or any hair at all. The torso was round, kind of like a tin can. His hands seemed to have three long fingers. I couldn't see any neck, but he was dressed in a material that was like silver, but it wasn't shiny. This covered all of him except the head part, which had on the helmet. He didn't look at me at all. So this is clearly not an average human. Now the room was also quite weird. It kind of had glass-like walls, but looked opaque. Parts of it, parts of it were transparent. And as the sun shone down, John could feel the heat. And this strange man who had taken him on board this craft pulled a lever and a bluish tint protected both of them from the sun. And John was really amazed at what was happening and he had a great difficulty processing the whole experience. As he says in his own words, my first thought was that I was dreaming. And then my second thought was that I was dead and my soul was rising up. So he watched in amazement as the craft approached the moon, close enough that he could see the craters and rocks in great detail. At this point, the craft stopped for just a moment. It moved to the right, at which point John could now see the earth far below him. And the next thing he knew, both the moon and the earth were receding very quickly. So it became clear to him he was in outer space and moving off to another destination. And as John says, Then I began to think that this was from another planet. And moments later, John saw that they were, in fact, approaching another planet. In fact, it came so fast he thought that they were going to crash on it. But instead, the craft suddenly leveled out and they were skimming across the surface of this strange planet. He had no idea where they were. But as he says in his own words, I looked out over the land and it looked like a paradise. On one side there were red fields. On the other side there were what looked like gray green fields. Some places in the fields were what looked like big chimneys rising from the ground. It was bright daylight and the sun was shining with no clouds in the sky. We were approaching the red fields and I could see rivers with blue water in them. Then we glided up to a field that was filled with the saucers like I was in. There appeared to be hundreds of them. So the craft he saw were different colors, gray, gold, and silver. And the pilot of the craft he was on parked the craft on this weird platform and quickly exited. And looking around him, John saw others of the same type of beings that had taken him. And he was looking out at some of the other craft, and he was really surprised to see normal humans inside them. One craft had a woman with two kids in it. Another held a man and a woman. And looking around him at the landscape, he saw what looked like a herd of cows in the distance. He couldn't really tell they were quite far away. But on the ground, he saw big red flowers below him. And he wondered, you know, could this be Mars? He really had no idea. He did see tall bridges and also noticed that these rivers or canals were basically straight. So this was just a short moment and suddenly the strange man returned to the craft and they took off. And very quickly they passed what looked like a small silvery moon, which was totally smooth, no craters. And after about 10 minutes, John saw the Earth's moon approaching. Earth was in the distance. And in a matter of seconds, Earth zoomed up so quickly that John once again feared a collision. But they didn't collide, and in fact they came down towards the ground very quickly. John at this point was filled with fear. In fact, he wondered if this ET was going to actually kill him in order to keep this experience a secret. But instead, the man did nothing like that. All he did was point this weird pencil-like device at John who again found himself unable to move and floating along back to where he had been taken. 
this point, the man took off the weird plate-like device that he had placed on John, returned back to the craft, which promptly took off. Needless to say, this left John quite amazed and fearful. He was about a quarter mile from home at this point. He ran home, excited, astonished, and his wife immediately noticed that he was absolutely going crazy with excitement, and she asked him what happened. And he told her, nothing, I'm just sick. And as John says, I couldn't tell her about the experience because she would have thought I was completely crazy. I noticed the time when I got home, and it was 12.20 a.m. The whole trip had taken about an hour. So John told nobody, not even his wife, for a long time, simply because he feared that nobody would believe him, and he was also afraid that the ETs might come back if he talked about what happened. But as he became an older man and began suffering from ill health, he decided it was time to tell his story. And as John says in his own words, I'm telling this now in order to help people to know what is going on in space. My heart is bothering me now, and I feel I won't be living much longer, so I have nothing to fear from those people. From this experience I have had, I feel those people's culture and scientific knowledge is much ahead of ours. They seem to power their ships with rays, maybe light rays, but it's not with motors like ours. My experience and seeing those other Earth people on that planet show me that these people have a great knowledge of the people here and are much ahead of us. This creature treated me as only an animal. So he really wondered where he had gone. Was it Mars? He didn't know. But the whole experience left him quite afraid. It wasn't long after the experience that John and his wife moved to Canada. And years later, as he says, I have finally felt I want to make this story public. I have told you it just as I remember it happening. And it is just as clear as yesterday. So again, this case has not been widely reported. And there are some researchers who feel that it might be a hoax, but of course none have been able to prove any evidence of this. The reporter who interviewed John says he did his best to disprove the story and catch the witness in contradictions, but he was unable to do so. And as he says, I tried to look for loopholes in his story and tried to catch him up on many of the smaller details. He couldn't be caught. But what's interesting about John's case is that he describes details that we often see in today's modern accounts. So who knows? You can make up your own mind about it. While there are those who are skeptical of that case, I find it very compelling. The witness clearly seems sincere, and the descriptions he gives of these short humanoids being paralyzed during the encounter, the description of the craft, and so forth, are all very reminiscent of other encounters. I wish we could talk to this witness today. I suspect he's passed on, but it's certainly a compelling encounter that I wish was thoroughly investigated. But you can make up your own minds about it. I do think it's worth knowing about. And here is another case of the five I'm presenting today. This is probably the most well-known. It has some really compelling evidence to it in terms of physiological effects. There is apparently an outside witness as well. And I call this case examined by robots. This took place on September 29, 1974 in Pacienza, Brazil. This case caused quite a sensation when it became publicized. The witness initially wanted to keep it secret but was unable to do so because he needed to seek treatment following the uh, medical effects he had as a result of his encounter. It's a really interesting and very unusual case, but also contains some elements we often do see in onboard UFO encounters. This very unusual case was investigated in depth by experienced researcher Irene Granchi. The witness in this case is Antonio La Rubia. He's a bus driver, and each morning he has to get up very early for his job. On September 29, 1974, 
He was up at around 2.15 a.m. and was walking across the field near, near his home when he saw a strange craft landed in the field. He thought for just a second it might be a company bus, but it clearly couldn't be because this was out in the middle of a field and it looked quite different. And as Antonio says, there, in the middle of it, stood this huge thing, so large it went beyond the boundaries of the football field, which is more than 70 meters across. I had not believed in flying saucers, but this was one, no doubt. It was shaped like a hat, a dull leaden color. It looked like an enormous hat. So Antonio at this point became afraid, and he was about to turn and run, but then a blue light lit up everything around him, and he found himself unable to move. As he says, I only took two steps back, for then I was nailed to the ground and saw two little men grabbing me. I cannot recall how I entered the disc, but suddenly there I was, floating between two rows of a dozen little men on each side. They were small, but had large shoulders. Their heads were like those American footballs. There was total silence. So these beings were very unusual looking. They were not very tall, about five and a half feet tall, very close to his height. He said they looked almost robotic, with metallic oval-shaped heads, shaped like a football, but set on end. And on the top, where there was what looked like a kind of antenna. And where the eyes would be, there was instead a row of small blue pulsating lights. These beings had two long arms with no apparent hands that he could see on the end. They reminded him a little bit of an elephant's trunk. And for legs, they had what looked like a sort of pedestal. He said the surface of their body was rough and scaly, and the color of aluminum. So they looked very much like robots. But he was confused because he could hear what sounded like breathing. And they seemed to move freely, not in a robotic way. But there were a lot of them. Now the first thing he did see when he entered this craft was a long white corridor. He was immediately taken into a circular room which was brilliantly lit with blue and white light. And it was then that he noticed the walls were transparent and he could actually see outside which was amazing to him because looking at the craft, he couldn't see inside it from the outside. But from the inside looking out, he could see everything. But mostly, his attention was occupied by these strange beings. And there were so many of them. As Antonio says, there were only those strange little men around, about 50 of them. I felt as if I were in a crystal bell jar and felt that they were communicating among themselves as their heads turned around when they were saying something. They kept still and watched me with fiery eyes. So he's saying that he found himself in this little sort of transparent container. He was able to move his body, but couldn't get out of this sort of glass-like bell jar type container. And the beings were all around them, and he got a good look at them. You could see that they each had belts, or what looked like belts, around their waist, with little kind of syringe-like devices hanging from them. They weren't syringes. It was something else. He saw a weird sort of piano-like instrument in the room, but otherwise it was completely empty. And as he watched, these beings began to take these little devices hanging from their waist and put them into the piano-like instrument. And it was then that the screen appeared on the wall, which drew his attention, and it began to flash various images. And it seemed like each time one of these beings placed one of these devices from their waist onto this machine, it caused a different image to appear. And as Antonio says, they showed me a horse drawing a cart, a dog barking, and a sudden flash that killed the animal. On the screen, I was also shown a countryman in a straw hat. I do not know what all that meant but I was all the more surprised when I watched myself on that screen. I was naked and they were studying me. So these images continued to flash. They showed all kinds of images, one of, one of these beings themselves being killed. They showed him being examined by human-looking doctors, something which later actually happened. 
They showed him all kinds of things, um, a few which he at first refused to describe. But later he was interviewed, and he said to the best of his memory, he was shown about 10 or 15 images. And he tried to put them in order, but he said this was difficult because all of this happened quite quickly, and he was, of course, very much surprised by what was happening to him. But he says the first thing he believes he saw on this screen was himself undressed and being examined by these ETs with blue lights. He saw himself standing alone, still with no clothes on. The third image, he saw himself dressed up to go shopping, actually carrying a shopping bag and look, looking nervous. Uh, and the fourth image was a peasant with ragged clothes and a straw hat with a horse-drawn cart on a dirt road. So, so then the next one after that, or joined to this one, he's shown himself being examined by doctors, saw himself vomiting, soiling his pants. Now this later happened and he felt like this was kind of a warning or sort of a message that this would be happening to him. He saw himself standing next to a bright orange globe of light Next, he saw one of the beings standing next to a bright blue globe of light. So these were all very strange images, a lot of which didn't make sense to him. He next saw one of the beings standing next to a barking dog, which was trying to bite him. And this being began to melt. Another being appeared, pointed a device at the dog, which caused it to melt. This is what he remembered. Next, he saw something quite strange, what looked like a E.T. factory showing rows of disc-shaped craft being built. These craft were at all stages of construction, with countless of these same beings around them hard at work. Next, he saw a metallic train with no windows entering a tunnel, and this was followed by an image of one of the beings taking a blood sample. Now, he's a little confused here because he says this did actually happen. Uh, his arm lifted up by itself and one of the ETs took a blood sample. So some of these were images of things that were actually happening to him or did later happen. But next, he saw a street filled with cars, really crowded so that none of the cars were moving. So there also felt like a warning of some kind. But yeah, he said they took a blood sample they showed him images of this blood sample, which showed three circles with lines through each one. So it took a lot of strength for him to talk, and finally he shouted out to them, Who are you? What do you want from me? He's shouting at the top of his voice. And as if in response to his shout, the beings all lifted their arms up to the tip of their antenna, which seemed to be rotating, and fell to the floor, just tumbled to the floor. And in fact, Antonio had the impression that it was his loud shout which caused this. But immediately after this, as again in response, Antonio found himself struck by a beam of light which rendered him unable to move. And he could actually feel the heat coming from this light. So this beam of light slowly began to dim and Antonio started to feel himself losing consciousness. And the next thing he knows, he says he, they almost kind of tossed him out of the craft. But he found himself on the road in a different location, next to the bus station where he worked. This was more than two miles away from where he, he had been taken. At this point, the craft and the beings were gone. It was now 2.55 a.m., which meant that the entire experience had lasted about 40 minutes. So he rushed to the bus station, which was very close, and his co-workers could see that he was sweating, uh, very, very hot. So they kind of hosed him down and rushed him to the hospital. Antonio didn't want to go, but he really needed to. And when he got to the hospital, his temperature was about 107 degrees. The doctors could not believe that he was alive. His temperature quickly went down, but this fever kept returning. His temperature began to fluctuate up and down uncontrollably for a little while. 
and over the next few days, he suffered some pretty alarming symptoms, including nausea and diarrhea, body aches, headaches, an itchy rash over much of his body, hematomas and swelling at the joints, shortness of breath, extreme thirst, loss of appetite, and of course, emotional distress. Weirdly, the doctors did not test him for radiation. They did give him a psychological test when he started talking about his encounters, which he passed, showing himself to be an intelligent, well-balanced individual, though clearly traumatized by his encounter. His medical symptoms persisted for a couple of weeks, even a month later. He says he felt strangely dissociated. He had never planned on telling anyone what happened, but it was because of his symptoms that he basically had to tell the doctors the truth, and that was when his encounter became pretty well known. So again, he was interviewed by Irene Granchi, and later it was discovered that there was another witness by the name of Celcel, who was walking in the area around 2 a.m. on the evening Antonio was taken. Celso heard a loud humming noise and saw a classic flying saucer, described much like Antonio did. This was near Monte Carlo Street and Praca Ponto Chic Chic, which is very near where this encounter happened. So this case did get a lot of publicity, and with the medical evidence, it's a pretty well-verified case, and has certainly never been proven to be a hoax. As can be seen, the medical effects in that case leave little doubt that something really profound happened to the witness. It's very hard to fake something like that. Certainly those who know the witness vouch for his sincerity, his credibility. Uh, it's an alarming case, given that his symptoms were quite severe. It's also very interesting all the messages he was given. The ETs he describes are unlike any I really remember hearing about anywhere. So that in itself, I think, makes the case very important. It's a very unusual case. They're all unusual. <laughs> it seems that these variety of ETs is just endless. And now we move to the next case. And this one I call, I Did Not Dare Talk About It. This case occurred in Bourges de Page, France. It occurred on June 11, 1976. This was pretty early on in terms of onboard experiences. It wasn't super well known at the time. This case was recalled through the use of regressive hypnosis, though the witness did have absolute conscious recall of her UFO encounter, which involved missing time. There's a lot of controversy surrounding hypnosis, but the details that she recalls match up very well with other cases involving fully conscious recall. So I think it's a legitimate case. It didn't get a whole lot of attention, certainly not in the United States. It was a brief sensation in France when it had occurred, but it's a very compelling case. This case got a lot of attention in the French press. The main witness is Helen Juliana, age 20, it was around 1.30 a.m. on June 11, 1976, when Helene had just visited the movies in Valence, and she was driving home along the 531 National Road. This has now been renamed the 532 Road. But she was driving over the Martinet Bridge just after Pizancon. This is near Chalousange le Goubet when her car mysteriously began to slow down. She at first wondered if she had run out of gas, but quickly looking at the gas gauge, she saw that there was still plenty of fuel. But her engine continued to give her trouble when suddenly the headlights went out, as did the entire electrical system. At this point, the engine stalled and she rolled to a stop. She was frantically trying to restart the car when she saw something in front of her, something amazing. It was a bright, bright light blocking the road, and it seemed to be sitting on the road itself. As Helene says in her own words, It is then that I saw, at about 15 meters in front of my car, a luminous mass of orange color. 
I was very afraid, and I locked the doors of my immobilized car and put my hands in front of my eyes. At the end of a moment, withdrawing my hands from my eyes, I noted that the luminous mass had disappeared. So Helene isn't sure how long she was looking at this light. It seemed only moments, but there was a weird sort of timelessness to all of this. She does remember locking the car doors, shielding her eyes from the light, and then the light was just gone. At this point, as Helene says, I actuated the starter and the car started up without problems. I returned at home so upset that I missed the most direct road and made a too long trip by Baume d'Elston, which is not my usual road. When I arrived at home, it was four in the morning. So her sister was at home, and it was she who pointed out the time to Helene. Helene was absolutely shocked, because this trip took her about two hours longer than it should have. Weirdly, the road she was on, the 531 road, is a pretty busy highway, even at night. So it made no sense that she could have been two hours late. And Helene didn't want to talk about the encounter, as she says... I did not dare talk about it. I was afraid of being ridiculed. But she did, and before long, Helene's case received considerable attention and was published in several newspapers. And this was when she was contacted by researchers who asked her if she would go under hypnosis, which she agreed to do. And it was professional hypnotist André Révaux who put her under a trance and led her back to the incident. And this was done in the presence of reporters. Under hypnosis, Helene did recall her car failing, coming to a stop, and then seeing this dazzling light blocking the road in front of her. The next thing she recalled was two small beings approaching. This she had not remembered before. She saw these two small beings approach. They took her out of her car. And she says that they were very short so short that the top of their heads came up to her chest. She said they were dressed in a black one-piece jumpsuit with a kind of hood, and she described them as, quote, very ugly dwarves. She said that they had large, round, dark eyes, a sort of flattened nose, a very small mouth, which never opened. She didn't notice any ears or hair but she says they placed kind of a, quote, towel on her face, and they started to carry her towards this lighted object standing in the road. And next thing she knows, she's inside a room, a small room with a rounded ceiling. She saw what looked like strange buttons on the wall, white, red, and yellow lights. Everything in the room seemed to be made of metal. She was placed on a metal table where she was restrained, and one of these dwarf-like beings, she says, held a flashlight-like object in his hands and proceeded to shine it down on her upper torso in kind of a weird series of circles. She felt like this was some sort of examination, which seemed to be brief, but she couldn't really be sure. She says that they spoke at her with gestures, and seemed to become frustrated with her uh, inability to understand. As she says, they were trying to make me understand something. What it was, she doesn't know. But the next thing she knew, she was being led back to her car, which, quote, reappeared in front of her as if it were invisible before. So she was placed inside her car, The small figures walked back to the light, which rose quickly in the sky, and was gone. Now, when Helene was brought out of hypnosis, she still had no memory of the missing time, or what she had actually said under trance. So they played the tape for her, they recorded it, and hearing all these details, this really surprised her, because she had no memory of this. And in fact, she had some difficulty believing what she had recalled under hypnosis. However, the conscious part is absolutely uh, something she says did happen, and those who know her say that she's a very honest and sincere person and is absolutely telling the truth.
Her family backs her up. At that time, Helene was employed by the mayor of the nearby town of Hostung, and he also vouched for her honesty and integrity. I can only imagine what it must be like for the witness to go through something like that. And to me, the fact that she is somewhat skeptical of what she recalled under hypnosis just brings a new level of credibility to the case. Because she's certainly not seeking fame or fortune or anything like this. Like most witnesses, she did not want to talk about it, and she didn't initially for some time. It's a, a truly incredible case. And here is another one, which I'm, again, pretty sure you haven't heard of before. This one is a very unusual case involving different types of humanoids. It was recalled fully consciously as well. Uh, for at least initially, uh, he did go under hypnosis and recalled additional details, but absolutely an astonishing case. I call this one, what would you want more than anything in the world before you die? So this is a direct quote from the case itself, as we shall see. It occurred in June of 1976 in Indian John Hill, Washington. It's an excellent case of be careful what you ask for, because this involves a gentleman who asked for an encounter and he received it. And boy, did he ever receive it. And it had a profound effect on the rest of his life. The main witness in this case is Rick A. Hale. And he was only 21 years old when his life changed forever. And his encounters started in a very interesting way because this was something he actually asked for. He was trying to make contact. One evening in June 1976, he was out camping in the Forks, Washington area when, on a lark, he began wondering about ESP and if, quote, alien beings might be able to pick up on his thoughts. So he's not sure why he did this, but he started reaching out to extraterrestrials. As Rick says in his own words, So, I decided I would try to contact a UFO by directing my thoughts to space and try to convince or entice a UFO to land and let me come aboard. And I would drive around going to different places where I thought they would like me to wait for their craft. I realize this would sound kind of crazy to most people, but at the time, it seemed quite logical to me. So he was doing all of this sort of what we call CE5 work. And it was only a few days later that one evening, in still June of 1976, he was driving along the I-90. He took the Tanum Creek exit and spontaneously started heading down this little road towards Eagle Valley. This road passed over the I-90, and he, it veered to the right. And this is when he saw them, three strange beings. As Rick says, they appeared to be about six feet tall, dressed in white suits and white helmets with dark visors. The beings seemed to be about 10 to 20 yards away, walking slowly in a grassy field towards the road I was on. So he instantly knew what was happening. He instantly concluded that these were, in fact, ETs, and that his efforts to make contact had succeeded. But instead of being happy about it, he says a visceral fear swept over him, and he literally began to panic. As he says, The feeling of being alone with these beings was too much for me to handle. I wanted to get back to civilization as soon as possible. But unfortunately, the road was very narrow, so he had no choice but to drive towards these beings who were walking towards the road. So he sort of drove down the road, drove past the beings who were still walking quite slowly, so he felt he would definitely have time to turn around. He drove about a quarter mile ahead on the road, pulled a quick three-point U-turn, and headed back. And as Rick says... That quarter of a mile drive back was the longest drive of my life. So, having turned around, he could still see these beings walking towards the road. 
and as he drove by them, he saw a strange beam of light in the sky heading in his direction. But by this point, he saw the highway up ahead of him with traffic on it, and he says he very quickly reached it, went straight to a Holiday Inn in Ellensburg, which was just off the I-90 freeway. But as he checked in, he was shocked to discover that it was now 2 a.m. He was missing about an hour and a half of time. At the time, he didn't think much of it. He hadn't really heard of missing time. But afterwards, he began to feel a lot of trauma. He felt great that he had actually made contact. But when he started telling people about it, they didn't believe him, and he didn't know how to handle all of this. He became very depressed. He turned to drugs. He suffered a lot of mental anguish, had a near mental breakdown, even to the point of thinking he was the reincarnation of Jesus. This is what he says. He was also having dreams of meeting ETs and being in contact with them. Eventually, he did, he did recover. He went on with his life. He found work, he married, he had children. But then, 12 years later, after hearing about other people's UFO encounters and missing time, he contacted Eileen Garut Edwards of the UFO Contact Center, UFOCCI, who agreed to put him under hypnosis. Now, this did take several sessions, because each time he began to remember this encounter, he would begin to cry uncontrollably. But finally, he did remember what happened. He says that instead of driving by the ETs after turning around, uh, he thought he had gone on to the freeway without any interruption, but that's not what happened. His car actually stalled. These ETs approached his car. He got out of the car and was desperately trying to control his fear. And he found himself saying, saying and acting in ways that really surprised him. He says to control his fear, he found himself telling them, I might be the reincarnation of Christ. He doesn't know why he said that, but that's what he said. At this point, he was too afraid to even look at these beings. And one of the ETs spoke to him in a deep male voice and said, okay, follow me. And he found himself following them dutifully into a field where they came upon a small craft. And as he was led inside this small craft, the ET said something very strange. It said, if you were Christ, you would be more afraid than you are now. So at this point, Rick was still too scared to look around. He kept his eyes down as he walked into the craft. But very quickly, this smaller craft took off and went immediately to a larger craft not far away, still on the ground. Uh, This larger craft was olive green, he says, with a sort of oblong triangular shape. The smaller craft had landed. Rick got out and walked up to this larger craft, up a small ramp, which he said kind of had the texture of dark, polished marble. Once inside the larger craft, he says it was cold inside, had kind of a musty smell. He saw a young teenage woman Uh, They hugged, and she told him that the doctor was waiting in the other room to give him an examination. And he went into this other room, or found himself in it. It was a circular room next to a curved hallway. He could now see a row of tinted windows that went around the room. And in the center of the room was a five-foot-long, sort of translucent blue table, supported by a single pedestal. Now he's looking out through the windows and he could see three four-foot-tall bald figures wearing white overcoats. He says they looked like typical greys but were too far away to make out much detail. But the next thing he knew, he's recalling this under hypnosis, he was lying on the table, undressed with a sort of blanket over him. And a human male stood beside him wearing a doctor's uniform And this man introduced himself as Carl. According to the witness, this man, Carl, had short black hair and a beard. But also he saw another figure standing at the foot of the table. Rick says it was a sort of hairy creature that looked like a dog man, complete with teeth and claws. 
and it was this dog-like creature who removed the blanket and began to examine Rick. And as Rick says in his own words, I believe it was examining a skin condition, kind of a rash that I had developed when I was about 13 years old. The wolf being grabbed my knees, and I became very scared of it. Then I heard a voice say, Don't be scared. He won't hurt you. That calmed me down, and the wolf being finished his examination of my body and left. Then a voice told me it was okay to get up and get dressed. The next thing Rick knew, he was in another room talking to a human-looking male who asked him, What would you want more than anything else in the world before you die? And I'll just let Rick describe what happened next because it's quite interesting. As Rick says, This question kind of stunned me because I felt this person may have the power to grant me my reply. Plus, the thought of maybe he was going to kill me also entered my mind. My mind started to race with thoughts like millions of dollars, a wife and kids, live forever, become the president of the USA. Then a thought of Christ dying on the cross came to me, and I looked up at the leader and said, Peace on earth. At this point, the leader smiled, but didn't reply. And instead, Rick found himself being led to another room, which was kind of a sunken room with pillars all around the perimeter. And this was quite a few feet down. And someone next to Rick asked him, would you be able to get down to the floor? And Rick said, sure. And he dutifully hopped down into the sunken room. And this is where he saw another examination table. And although he was fearful, he decided it was best to cooperate and decided to just lay down and submit to what they, he thought they wanted, which was another possible exam. And at this point, he saw bright flashing lights. He heard a humming sound. He could feel the table vibrating. He became frightened again, closed his eyes, and opening them, he saw some strange instruments around him. So apparently he was being examined again. This went on for about a minute when suddenly everything became still. The sound stopped. Rick opened his eyes and saw that he was now alone. He hopped off the table. He saw a staircase leading upward, so he went up the stairs. And this is when he saw a blonde-haired human male who told Rick that it was time for him to go for a ride. And the next thing Rick knew, he was flying through the air, watching the craft recede behind him and realized he was heading back towards his car. As this is going on, he starts chanting to himself, I won't forget, I won't forget, I won't forget. Next thing he knows, he's being placed in his car. He feels his head going down and resting on the steering wheel, and he kind of fell asleep. And when he woke up, he had completely forgotten the entire experience. So this is what he recalled under hypnosis, Rick does remain a bit ambivalent about the hypnotic recall, but he does say that some of it did match the dreams he was having following his encounter. I think you'll agree that's an absolutely astonishing case, one with an enormous amount of detail to it. I love that the witness was able to provide drawings of some of what he experienced because that definitely helps bring the case to life. And it's just so unusual how the ETs communicated with him. Um, all of it is unusual, particularly the types of ETs he saw. And now we move to the last case of this little collection. I call this one, They Are Real Nice. And this, I don't have the exact date of this. It was probably late 1980s, early 1990s. And the location is not listed precisely either, but apparently is somewhere in the state of Georgia. This one is a really profound case. This one is fully consciously recalled. And the main witness is a very young boy who has been having regular contacts with ETs. And what happens to him when he's taken on board is so interesting. The details he describes I have heard before but he describes them in real amazing detail. 
And he also describes some really kind of interesting and unusual incidents that occurred to him while he interacted with these ETs, who appear to be the typical greys. This last case is probably my favorite of this little collection because it's so interesting. It comes from researcher C. Lee Culver, and it involves a 10-year-old boy who is given the pseudonym Peter. And although the exact date and location of this case is unknown, Peter's case is of particular interest because of the experiences he describes. Now, Peter says that around age four or five, he started to be contacted by ETs, who he describes as having very large heads, yellowish eyes, no visible ears, and a very small mouth. He said that they have dark, almost bluish skin, very short neck, long arms, and he says that they are, quote, skinny and bony about the ribs. At the hips, you can see where the bones connect. He says, quote, the aliens kind of look like lizards. He says that they all look identical to each other, except one is a little bit taller than the others. And as Peter says, he's the one that tells me where to go. He's a leader or something. Uh, Peter said that he doesn't think that they wear clothes. Uh, he says that they are both male and female, uh, but you can't really tell by looking at them. As he says, you couldn't tell by looking at them. You just know. He said that they communicated with strange sounds that he can't understand. But as he says, they talk weird, but they are real nice, friendly and curious. They usually tap my shoulder and point to something or somewhere. I just know what they want me to do. So perhaps he's getting telepathic communication here, though he didn't say that specifically. Now, Peter's experiences are fully conscious. He says they usually occur about once a month. He's usually taken from inside his home, though sometimes he has been outside, and he knows to go inside so that the ETs can pick him up. He just gets a feeling. And on most occasions... The purpose of these onboard experiences is to be taken to what he calls, quote, the library. And as Peter says in his own words, it's oval-shaped, with books everywhere, with a bench in the middle. He says this library room is blue-gray in color, and as he says, there is always enough light to see, but you can't tell where the light is coming from. He says there's a shelf on one side of the room with books on it, all written apparently in English. But on the other side of the room is a shelf filled with books which are apparently written in different languages. Now he's not sure what languages as he doesn't go to that side of the room. Instead, he's told by the ETs to read the English books, which he says are all nonfiction and all about, quote, the earth, our planet, nature, and people. And when asked by C. Lee Culver, the researcher, if he could recall any of the titles of these books, Peter said yes. He says one of the books is called Earth and Its Environment. Another is called Mars, Does It Have Any Plants? And a third was called Earth, the Living Something He Doesn't Remember. But all of these books, according to Peter, are about nature, the ozone layer, the environment, these kinds of subjects. And he says the ETs bring him there just to read the books while they watch and observe him. Now he does say that this room had two other doorways to what appeared to be other rooms. He called one, quote, the yellow room and the other, quote, the white room. Because he says whenever the ETs went in there, these other rooms are lit with either a yellow light or a white light. But he has no idea what's in those other rooms as he has never been taken in there. And while these onboard experiences are usually all about reading books, he says sometimes he's taken into this same room not to read books, but to play with different types of weird E.T. toys or instruments. One he specifically remembers, it reminds him sort of of a Rubik's Cube, except it is round in shape. It's sort of a puzzle with different shapes and colors that has to be put together in a certain way. And as Peter says, they would sit and watch me, like they're trying to figure out if you're smart enough to do this. 
So Peter's story, which was reported in an article for UFO Encounters magazine, has some other interesting aspects to it. Because as Peter says, when he is taken, the ET scoop him up and he spends an hour or two, or maybe more on some occasions, with the ETs, and then they return him home. But he finds that no time has passed. So several times he said he was outside playing when he felt the ETs calling him. He went inside, they scooped him up, he stayed there for as long as the experience took, and then would be returned. So while hours passed for him, almost no time passed here on earth. And as Peter says, my friends would think I had gone inside to get a drink of water or gone to the bathroom. So he wasn't really talking about this to anybody. But Peter does recall one kind of interesting and somewhat amusing incident. Uh, he and his friends from next door were having a water gun fight, a squirt gun fight. And suddenly, Peter saw this strange light flashing. He recognized it, knew it was the ETs calling him. And the next thing he knew, he was on board. But he still had a squirt gun in his pocket. And being a mischievous little kid, he quickly pulled it out and, as he says, squirted the tall one. He screeched and started shaking, and then he ran back to the yellow room. They started talking again, and then they came out, and they started saying stuff and told me to sit down. Now Peter could see that they were upset that he had pulled out the squirt gun and squirted him, and he tried to explain that he was just playing and there were, that there was nothing in the squirt gun but water. But the next thing he knew, he was being returned back home. And this is one of very few times that he wasn't returned to the same time. It was considerably later. Peter remembers this vividly because he was pretty unhappy that he couldn't go back outside and continue playing squirt guns with his friends. It was much later. Now, Peter is not alone with his experiences. His mother also has experiences. She never talked to Peter about it. But he did seem to know on his own, because once after she was returned from an onboard encounter, Peter came into her room to console her and make sure that she was okay. As it turns out, his mother doesn't really like her experiences. She feels that the ETs are using her as, quote, a baby factory. Now, when Peter asked why the ETs are here and what their purpose is, Peter had a very interesting answer for the investigator. As he says, I don't know what their purpose is, except they only think, the only thing I can think of is to maybe save the Earth and other planets from the harmful things that are happening to them, because they have these books about the environment and the bad things that are happening. Now, the investigator, C. Lee Culver, he says that he has many other cases where people are given, quote, alien ecology lessons. And he also has other cases where children are shown books that show extinct animals on Earth or animals that have become extinct on other worlds. I really like that case. It's not often that you get to hear from very young children while they're still having their experiences. And as that case shows, he's certainly not alone with them given that these encounters are also happening to his mother. And that is actually more the rule than the exception. It's a really remarkable case with a lot, I think, to teach us about UFO contact. So those are the five cases I wanted to present to you today. I think you'll agree they're all very unusual and have some very interesting things to say about what it's like to have contact, the type of ETs people see, their, the ET agenda on our planet, um, given that these people are often being physically examined and that sort of thing. And it's just darn interesting. To me, the onboard experiences, again, are the most interesting of all UFO cases. And again, they have the most to tell us about ETs themselves. So that's it for today. I really want to thank you for watching. I truly appreciate it. I hope perhaps you learned a little bit and it were at the very least entertained. And until next time, keep asking those difficult questions. 
Keep searching for the truth because it's out there. Most important of all, keep having fun. Till next time, I will see you later.